Good morning, Maka. Uh, and to everyone else, uh, I don't think there's any great announcements. Keep an eye on your uh, SIT. Uh, just a reminder, we did shoot out this morning an invitation for upcoming wedding. Um, oh, well, there we go, Scott and Emily over there somewhere at the back. Uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, also, just to encourage you, uh, in the SIT, which you read yesterday, um, just the camp committee, they are doing a lot of work to make it a really useful time together as a congregation. Let's all try to purpose in our hearts to prioritise that camp. If anyone's got any fiscal reasons they can't make it, but it's just too much financial pressure, uh, then please speak to any one of those camp committee members and we will do all we can to endeavour that you can be there, you and your family. So uh, there are, we don't want any reasons why anyone doesn't come. If want to come, it'll be a great weekend. We, we can accelerate our fellowship and spending time together and encouraging one another, which is always the, the primary purpose of our camps. is not teaching, but it's, it's fellowship and encouragement. So prioritise that, and if you need to start saving, start saving for that. Here's uh, our call to worship. It comes from Psalm 79, and the psalmist is struggling. Uh, the psalmist uh, uh, feels like uh, God is distant, and he's crying out and wondering how long will God be distant, how long will his enemies seemingly uh, accost him. And then he says in verse 8, and, and, and the psalmist is conscious of his own sins and Israel's sins. And so in verse 8, this is what he writes. He says, do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us. For we are, we are brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation. For the glory of your name, deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Well, he is with us. He's with us today. And he has come to save us and to atone for our sins so that we can rejoice in that salvation. Let's, let's pray. Father, it's one of the great joys of the Christian life that uh, we can enter into your presence through prayer, that we can beseech you uh, to receive us and to hear us, to bless us and to come speedily are to our side because our Lord Jesus Christ has loved us even unto death on a cross. And so this morning, would you come to us to bless, to encourage, to build up, to instruct, to teach, to rebuke and correct. Would you, through your word and through this worship and through our time of fellowship, would you recalibrate our hearts? Would you refocus our minds? Would you speak to us through your word? Would you glorify your son? Would you forgive our sins? And particularly we would pray, if there is any here this morning who uh, feel that you are distant, that you might draw near. Any who are lonely, that you might be their comfort. Any that are discouraged, that you would be their hope. And any who are struggling under the weight of sin, our oh, Father, we pray that you might be pleased to set them free. And so hear our prayer and forgive our sin and strengthen our faith and receive us in worship because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand and we'll sing our first song this morning of praise, 10,000 Reasons.
Grab a seat. How are we all going this morning? Ready to answer some questions? Who made you, Roger? Roger, Roger, who made you? God, good job. Uh, what else did God make? All things, good job. Shout it out, that's the way. All right, one more review. What is sin? Anyone remember that one? Yeah, have a go. Yeah, it's any transgression against the law of God. Good job. All right, now today's question is a scary one. It's actually really, really scary. It's about hell. But it's only scary if you don't love Jesus. So do you guys love Jesus? Yeah, put your hand up if you love Jesus. Put two hands up if you love Jesus. Shake them around if you love Jesus. Yeah. None of you are Presbyterians anymore. <laughs> All right. So today's question, it's 117, and it is, what will happen to the wicked in the day of judgment? Does anyone know? Yeah, have a go. Oh, very good. That's like perfect, though. I can word for word. The wicked shall be cast into hell. Do you know what cast means? Yeah, what? Thrown. Yeah, it's not like just pick them up and place them over here nice and gently. It's like throw them really hard and fast and they're far away. So that's a bit scary unless you love Jesus. So if you, love Je if you don't love Jesus on the day of judgment, you're going to get cast into hell. If you do love Jesus, then he'll save you. So this question, it's a bit scary, but because we love Jesus, like you all put your hands up, it's a good reminder of us how much Jesus loves us and how special it is to be loved by Jesus. Now, should we practice casting some people into hell so we can remember it? Yeah. Now, you all put your hand up, so we can't cast any of you into hell. Um, not like a couple of weeks ago when Mr. Heyman put some goats in hell. Uh, we won't do that. So I brought along a couple of friends. Now these guys, do you reckon they look wicked and evil? Really, really bad. Actually, they're not. They're not actually that bad. They're actually my friends and they're quite nice. Um, this guy, his name starts with B. What's the name that starts with B? Bob? Good one. Good name. Now Bob, he's a nice guy, but he, um, he drives a big land cruiser with a dirty V8 and it pollutes our atmosphere, and, um, and he also steals people's hunting spots. Um, so he's a nice guy, but even a little bit of sin is enough to send you to hell. And this guy, his name's uh, Daryl. Now, Daryl, <laughs> he's also a nice guy, but he owns two Land Rovers, which is very greedy, because you only need one Land Rover. And he also talks about them all the time, even though no one cares, because it's Australia. And we like Land Cruisers, not Land Rovers. So they're nice guys, but there's a bit of sin. And what do you reckon? Do they love Jesus? Let's see. <laughs> Everyone put your hands up if you love Jesus. Ah, oh, no, they don't. Put your hands up. They don't. Oh, so what do you reckon? Should we cast them into hell? Yeah, yeah all right. So casting is a bit like fishing. And there's a couple of fishermen here that I went fishing with last weekend that were very good at their casting. So they're going to come up, Riley and... Gus, can you guys come up here? And we're going to chuck Bob. Oh, we're a bit tangled. There was a lot of that last weekend too. All right, we're going to chuck Bob on this one. All right, you get ready, not just yet. Now, we haven't practiced this, so hopefully it works well. And everyone in the crowd, watch out. These guys are soft, but you probably don't want to pop them in the side of the head. All right. Now, I'm going to need one more volunteer because if you get cast into hell on the day of judgment, like Bob and Daryl are about to, there's no coming back. So I need someone to come and cut the fishing line. Who's good at the scissors? Yep, you can come up. All right. Can you, you got good scissor etiquette? All right, you ready, Gus? Remember how to do it? Yeah. Good job. All right, give it a go. Whoa, there he goes. All right. You know, all right, can you cut that for me? Cut that line. And he's gone. No coming back for Bob. All right, let's get rid of Daryl. All right, jump over here, Gus. 
All right. Got your bayonet flicked over. Good job. Give it a go. Oh, it didn't go too far. It's still going, though. That'll do. All right. And you can cut that one for me. Good job. And he's gone. Never coming back. All right. So, do you reckon that'll help us what to remember what will happen to the wicked in the day of judgment? Yeah. What was the answer? They'll be cast into hell. Yeah. But what if we love Jesus? What if we love Jesus? We'll get to spend forever with God in heaven. And we're safe from hell. All right, let's pray. And then we're going to sing our kids' song, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you uh, that you are powerful and that you are mighty and that you are just. We thank you, Father, that you sent your son, Jesus, uh, to live for us and die for us so that we would be uh, free from sin and that we wouldn't be cast into hell, but we can rather spend all the rest of time with you in heaven. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing our song. Thanks, boys. Okay, let us hear God's word. We're going to be reading from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 12. Uh, Jesus has just been teaching about the cost of following, and now he is, the Lord is sending out 72 ahead of him. So reading from verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town, and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Thanks be to God. Well, we're going to uh, have a second reading. Second reading comes from uh, Luke 9. Uh, but before we do, I'm going to pray um, 
just had news from the elders that so Hank has gone to hospital this morning. So no doubt that'll be a bit of a concern for you guys. So uh, I'll be praying for that as I pray for God also to um, help us understand Scripture. So I'll read from Luke 9, then we'll pray, and then we'll hear from God's Word. So reading from Luke chapter 9. So chapter 10 starts with the sending out of the 72. Chapter 9 starts with the sending out of the 12. And the whole of chapter 9 is all about what it is to follow Jesus, what it looks like to be a disciple. This is the Word of God. And he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whenever they do not receive you, when you leave the town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. And then if your eyes just drop down to verse 10, that's where you get the report when it comes back. And on their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. Amen. Well, let's, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you uh, to seek your blessing upon us, uh, your blessing upon us as we sit under your word, your blessing upon us as we sit under your providence. We uh, are mindful at this time that our brother Hank has been uh, taken to hospital and we just commend him to you. Uh, we pray for your provisions and grace for him. Uh, that they'll very quickly be able to ascertain uh, the problems and then find a solution according to your goodwill. We pray for his family for blessing and encouragement and we pray for each one of us uh, that we might have a confidence that he is in your hands and likewise that we are in your hands and that you've called us and gathered us here under your word and for the glory of your son and so we would pray that even now that you would shape us and recalibrate us through the word of God so that we might think the very thoughts of Christ. Uh, glorify him and build up your church, we pray, for we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, that's not fair. Uh, parents hear it, uh, siblings hear it, uh, teachers hear it, friends hear it. It's sort of like a, this a, a cry of anguish when... Uh, someone's expectations have not been met. Uh, maybe they feel that they were disciplined um, unjustly. Uh, maybe they've been treated differently. Uh, maybe a teacher marked them harshly. And so they're frustrated that things aren't working out how they expected. And so often they say, it's not fair. What we know as Christians, or I hope what you know as Christians, is life isn't fair. Ever since the fall, the world is not just sinful, but broken, and it doesn't work, and it is not fair. Not everyone is created equal, nor will everyone be treated equal. Life is not a level playing field. And the truth is you probably already discern for yourself is that the best person doesn't always get the job and the best team don't always win the game and the referee doesn't always get it right because life isn't fair some people are born into a bad home some people marry what turns out to be a bad spouse some people acquire what seems to be a bad disease and therefore, the sooner that you adjust your expectations of life, the better you'll cope with reality. If, if you don't understand life is not fair because we live in a broken world, you will lack resilience. You will be easily discouraged. 
And in a sense, that's what Jesus is doing with his disciples in our text today. He is preparing them for life as his disciples. He's preparing them to follow him, to serve him, to witness to him. And while he's doing that, he's shaping their expectations of what that might look like. He's shaping their expectations of what mission looks like. Remember, mission, by the way, is just a Latin word to send, to be sent. You know, this whole chapter bookended by, starts out with the sending out of the 12, finishes with the sending out of the 72. The whole chapter, those two bookends, is all about what it looks like to follow Jesus on mission. So we're going to do well to think about that over the coming weeks. Look at verses 1 to 2. And he called the 12 together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And notice how he had to call them together. Well, it's true that the disciples spent a lot of time with Jesus over those three or so years. We shouldn't imagine that they actually spent every hour together. It's not that they literally lived in each other's pockets. Some of them had homes and families and businesses. I had to go back to Capernaum where many of them lived. I had to attend to various responsibilities. And so Jesus often has to call them back. And so he's called the 12 together and he wants to equip them with both power and authority. And, you know, power is related to your ability to do something and authority is your right to do something. So uh, you might have the power or the capability to discipline children, especially naughty children, but you may not have the authority to do that. If you're unsure of that, discipline a naughty child in coals and see how that works for you. Right? But there's a difference between power and authority. Jesus gives them both. Give them powers to heal and to free. Authority over spiritual realms and spiritual beings as they go about proclaiming the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus is establishing the kingdom. These are the signs. The king has come. What are the signs? He's doing miracles. Demons, waves, the elements, people, diseases, all obey him. These are signs. And because Jesus and his apostles are the foundation of the church, remember at this point there's no New Testament Bible. Christ's work of salvation isn't even finished yet. And so he gives these demonstrations of power and authority that vindicate those whom he called and sent. And more than that, this is demonstrated to the disciples themselves who Jesus is. His power, his authority. And to that extent, because we, we live this side of Easter, uh, this side of the ascension of Pentecost of the New Testament, there is actually a discontinuity there. We, we don't have those same uh, powers and authorities that the apostles had because the kingdom has already been established. And, and they had these signs that were meant to manifest the kingdom as they went out to these towns and had authority uh, over diseases and even demons. They were, they were manifesting that Jesus come and his power is great. And even though we don't have those same powers today, not to say that miracles don't exist, of course they do, but it's just that it's not attached to an office any longer. Nonetheless, as his servants, we are still called to manifest the power of the kingdom. And you do that by how you live and, and, and how you serve and how you suffer and how you worship. That manifests the power of the kingdom that you will worship well and suffer well and serve well and live life well because of Jesus. And while all that's true, let's not get distracted from the main point of the text. The main point is obvious. Those whom he calls, he sends. 
If you're called, you're sent. If you gather, you scatter. Because those who assemble are always dispersed. Sunday is always connected to Monday. That's the point of the text. Those whom he calls, he always sends. But he says in John 20, verse 21, As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. It's the whole point of Matthew 28. The church has a mission. You go on as you are going, as you are sent. Make disciples who make disciples. Teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. If you are called, then make no mistake, you are sent. Because the Son was sent to establish the kingdom, the Spirit was sent to bring in the kingdom, and we are sent to proclaim the kingdom. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore we are ambassadors of Christ. God is making his appeal through us. That's what the text says. He goes on to say, We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God so you are not cast into hell. We are ambassadors sent. And God makes his appeal through us. And yes, God is sovereign. Yes, he predestines. Yes, he controls all things. Yes, there is purpose and order to this world. But yet we are the means by which he does that. Because he calls us and then he sends us. As ambassadors to proclaim the kingdom of the true king. That is the first thing in the text. It is the main thing in the text. If you hear nothing else, if you are called, you are sent. Not if you are called, you may be sent. You're sometimes sent. If you agree, you are sent. No, if you are called, you are sent. If you're a disciple, you're also on mission. That's the first thing that verses 1 and 2 teach us. Here's, here's the next thing, verse 3. The one who sends you, what they had to learn is not just that they are sent, but the one who sends will do so with sufficient resources. Look at verse 3. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no bag, no staff, no, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And of course, that, that's counterintuitive, isn't it? I don't know about you, uh, we, when you go camping, you were away for a weekend, you're trying to think, you look at the weather, you look at all your apps, how, how wet's it going to be, this is Geelong, how many, how many tops do I need to take? Um, what, you're trying to think of all of the possible outcomes for that period of time, and you pack extra shoes and extra clothes, take some extra moolah, uh, because you're trying to get everything covered. And yet here's Jesus, and he's sending him on a journey that I'm assuming is probably only weeks. And he says, take nothing except the clothes on your back and the sandals on your feet. Anything you have to take. He's not making a law about how Christians do mission. He's actually trying to teach them about the God who sends them on mission. He's training that you can trust God for all your needs. You, that's actually something you must learn. And if you're wealthy and very privileged, that's something you may not have even learned yet. If your life has gone swimmingly, and so far you haven't quite worked out life is not fair, then you might actually think you can do life on your own provisions. And here is Jesus, and he's trying to, Teach his disciples something about the God who sends. That he, he, he is sufficient for your every need. So he says to them, don't take stuff. Trust me, the one who sends. Or in the words of Matthew, seek first the kingdom and everything else will be added to you. And until you've learned that lesson, then anxiety or control issues will actually plague you all your days. Until you come to that point where you actually have 
convictions that God will provide. And even if I'm in lack, that is God's provision and I can trust him. If you don't come to grips with that, trust me, you will be plagued by anxiety or the opposite of that where you try to, you're anxious, so you try to control everything. And he's teaching the truth that Abraham had to learn on the mountain in Genesis 22, that Yahweh is Jehovah Jireh, he's the God who provides. And that's the point of what he's doing there. And we know that because if you were to bounce along through Luke's gospel, eventually you get to chapter 22, verse 35 to 36, just before he's arrested. And he tells his disciples, he says, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. And he said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it. And likewise, a knapsack. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. Jesus is not forbidding material things. He's teaching disciples not to be overly dependent upon material things things. I remember when I was trained to preach, uh, one of the, the blokes who was training me was a bloke called Reg Matthews, and he would make me preach without notes. He says, Middleton, you are not taking notes into the pulpit. You don't need them. You're going to learn how to trust God for preaching. And he wasn't making a law that you can't use notes or that notes are wrong. He's training me not to be dependent on notes to be prepared properly so that you don't need notes. That's good advice. Just last week I was saying to Daniel, two minutes into my sermon, my computer froze. But thankfully, because of Reg Matthews, I didn't freeze. I was able to preach the sermon without notes. He's not making a law. He's teaching you a truth. Don't become overly dependent on something. That's what Jesus is doing to the disciples. He's not saying it's wrong to take a sword or tunic or a little knapsack with skittles and a zero, whatever it is that you take when you go away. He's not saying that's wrong. He's saying don't become overly dependent on that. Don't become dependent on your bank account or your superannuation or your comfortable home and imagine somehow that you've got this covered. He's teaching them that God will provide them everything they need to do what God has called them to do. And then what you get in verses 4 and 5, the God who sends, the same God who gives sufficient resources, he's also, again, he's, he's calibrating their expectations. He's going, you will have varied responses. Now, in verses 4 and 5, he he sort of fleshes that out. And whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And we read from uh, Luke 10 where it elaborates a little bit more and it says, um, wherever you go, where they receive you. The word there is worthy. In Matthew's gospel, uh, Matthew 10, verse 11, says something very similar. It says, whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in and stay there until you depart. Remember, biblical times, not a lot of inns, not a lot of hotels. So when you go, especially to small towns, you, you, you don't actually have an expectation of finding an inn. And so the, the deal was you'd go to a small town, you'd go to the city gates, the elders are probably parked there, and then you find out from the elders who's worthy in the town. What does it mean by who's worthy? It means who is the one who obeys scripture? Who is the one who keeps the law? That family who does that, or many families who do that, will be the ones who will show hospitality to visitors. Leviticus 19, verse 33 to 34 says, When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, You shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. 
For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And the idea is that when you find someone worthy, when you go into the town, someone who will receive you, that is, receive you into their home, that will show hospitality, who are living out their faith, he says, stay there, go there. And you stay there and you proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom in that town until you depart. And then similarly, he says, you are going to go to some towns and they will not receive you. They will not take them in. We'll not show hospitality. We'll have no interest in their mission, not interested in Jesus or his kingdom. And Jesus says, when that happens, here's what you do, is you shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. Remember when God called Moses from that Midianite um, wilderness and he's at the burning bush and he says, Moses, Moses, take off your sandals of your feet. Why? Because the ground on which you are standing is holy ground. To this day, people still call Israel the holy land. To Jewish minds, everything outside of Israel was Gentile, it was unclean, it was unholy. Often when Jews would go on journeys outside of the promised land, on their return to the border, they literally would stop and then shake the dust off their feet. As if they were shaking off the unbelief of, and the sin of the Gentiles. The disciples knew exactly what Jesus was saying when he said that. If they won't receive you, they have no interest in the Messiah or his kingdom, then treat them like Gentiles and shake the dust of your feet. Shake off the dust of their unbelief. Because the truth is the gospel is not a debate. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to debate. I'm saying the gospel isn't actually a debate. It's a proclamation. It's a declaration. It's an announcement that we announce to people that, that God has sent his son into the world to die for sinners and he was raised for their justification. He now is at the right hand of the Father and that's the gospel, that's the good news. And then the only question is, is how will you respond to the good news? And the only acceptable response is repentance and faith. But of course people will not repent. Of course some people will reject the gospel. Of course some people will mock. That's not the point. The gospel is a declaration. And Jesus is calibrating their expectations that there are going to be seasons of blessing, but there will also be seasons of rejection. Some people will repent. Some towns will repent. Some will not. You should expect that on mission. Even in your own Christian lives, even in this church life, if you know that, if you understand that as you've been calibrated by Jesus' word, then you're not going to be easily discouraged. You're not going to be surprised when, when people reject the gospel or a town rejects the gospel or a family rejects the gospel or your neighbor or your boss or your friend or your family. And, and, and just as equally, when they do receive the gospel, you will not be easily carried away. Our mission, our witness, Jesus told us, he's calibrated our expectations and he's telling us that some of our kids, some of our family, some of our workmates, some of our neighbours, some will respond in repentance and faith. But he's also preparing them. Some will not hear you. Some will not listen to you. Some will have no time or no interest in Christ or his kingdom. And he wants you to know that. Because you're sent and you're resourced and you are now prepared for various responses. Look at verse 6 because that's what I want you to notice. You should be expecting that God is at work. And they departed and they went through the villages preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. In other words, they got a hearing. Towns received them. 
The gospel was proclaimed. Miracles were done. Souls were saved. Lives were changed. Neighbors were loved. The text says everywhere, throughout all the villages. And while it's true there are seasons of rejection, days of, you know, little things, periods of times of opposition, indifference, persecution, rejection, while all that is true, don't let that overwhelm the, the normative expectation is that God is at work. God is at work. Don't miss it. You should expect to see fruit. We, we, we should expect to see people come to know Jesus. We should expect God to be at work in you, but also through you. That should be your expectation. Because we are called by a gospel that saves and we are sent with a gospel that saves. So I've been in ministry 25 years or so. And yes, there's been challenges, discouragements, and there's always dramas. And even at the hardest of churches, which is my first congregation, we've all seen people converted and matured. Never been in a congregation that hasn't grown spiritually or numerically. Never taught or led a congregation or witnessed one where God was not at work in and through his people. You should expect that. Not, not just in your own life that God is at work in you, but through you. I know there are seasons and maybe even exceptions, but, but let us not get confused. You know, so often hear people quote, you know, Isaiah 6, you know, send me, send me. Oh, yeah, but by the way, no one's going to listen. That's right, because Isaiah was sent as judgment on Israel before they go to exile. But Jesus comes and what does he say? This is the year of the Lord's favor. It's the gospel era. The kingdom will come. The church will be built. The elect will be gathered. You should expect for God to be at work in you and through you. And that's why if you were to skip down to verse 10, when Jesus catches up with them for that debrief, it says the apostles told him all that he had done, they had done. In other words, they're telling stories about what they'd seen and done, of people who were healed and believed, of towns that were changed, as well as also the difficulties and the rejections. And he's debriefing them and he's encouraging them. In fact, he then takes them away on a little retreat to Bethsaida. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, you're either a missionary or an imposter. That's your two choices. If you're a Christian, you're either a missionary or an imposter. And Spurgeon's point is clear. If you follow Jesus, if you are to be faithful and fruitful, then you are on mission. You are sent. Every day, every hour, every relationship. And see, here's what I think. I think our expectations need to be recalibrated just like theirs. I think your expectations this morning need to be recalibrated. I mean, my expectations need to be recalibrated. Because I have no doubt that the reason you get mission drift in a church is no one starts out saying, well, hey, let's be unfaithful to Jesus. I know he called us, but we're not going. No one intentionally says that. But what they do is they drift. And so it comes about youth group or play group or Bible studies. And all those things are good and proper. But we forget it's also about witness. Our life is a mission. And that's a shock to, to far too many people in the Christian church. That your life is not your own. And if you follow Jesus, if he's called you in the gospel, you are sent. That's your life. Sure, you're a wife. Sure, you're a grandmother. Sure, you're a father. Sure, you're a brother. But you're also a missionary. You're sent on mission. You need to recalibrate your thinking. That's how we get mission trip, because we forget that's our first calling, to worship him and to bear witness to him. Some of us imagine that someone else will do it. 
Or maybe the whole mission thing is part-time. Or something you can put off to the future. And here is Jesus and he's teaching his disciples, not just in chapter 9, but chapter 10, Matthew 28. If you are called, you are sent. And you're supposed to say, so how's that going? How's that going for you? When you go to school, kids, when you go to school, Jesus sent you. I know your parents sent you, and your teachers expect you, but the Bible also says Jesus sent you. Men and women, young people, when you go to work, you're sent. When you get married, you're sent. When you're playing sport or you're watching sport or you're driving your awesome Land Rover or you're towing your friend's rubbish Land Cruiser from being bogged and, you, and you're sent. When you're drinking wine and you're eating food, when you're watching TV, when you're doing your gardening, when you're speaking to your neighbour, you're sent. You're sent. If you're called, you're sent. It's about recalibrating your expectations. When you're online, on social media, you're sent. It's about recalibrating your expectations that you'll also witness. I remember when I was, not long after I was converted, all the zeal of a young convert, early 20s and all. Uh, back that days, I used to drive this uh, Mark II Jaguar, uh, 1963, I think it was. Um, magnificent vehicle, got it, restored it. Drove it around, looked like I was a king, but I wasn't, I was a pauper, but it didn't matter. But, but I was very zealous, and so I used to have on all these Christian stickers and signs and stuff like that. But I was very zealous, but I wasn't necessarily very sanctified. And so some numpty would do the wrong thing on the road, and I'd be like giving them directions, hand directions, giving them some verbal encouragement on how they should change lanes or move out of the way or whatever it may be. Or perhaps you should see your doctor and see whether you should still be driving grandma or whatever the things I may or may not have said. But the point was, I'd forgotten that I was on mission and I'm abusing people from my car with my Jesus stickers on the back. Because I had actually forgotten that Sunday connected to Monday. And those who were gathered are always dispersed. And the sent, the called, are all sent. How's it going for you? Have, you? have you taken that thinking of being sent and have you brought it into all the rhythms of life? Or are you like me, like my wife sends me on errands to the supermarket? I don't really think about the supermarket because I said to her, I'll go to the supermarket after I've gone to the gym. And that's really all I'm really thinking about is the gym. Anyway, as I'm about to drive, I thought, oh, I've got to go to the supermarket. And I get to the supermarket, and I think, oh, what was I supposed to be here for? What does she want again? And I forgot my mission. I forget my mission so regularly. Maybe you do the same. Here's husband tip. When you forget your mission at the supermarket, it doesn't matter what she told you. You buy her flowers and chocolates, it doesn't matter. It's all fine when you get home. She'll actually willingly go to the supermarket after that herself. Take that as a, a wedding tip, Scott. Have you recalibrated your expectations? If God has called me and I'm claiming to be a Christian, he's also sent me. How's that going? The old saying, isn't it, that the church uh, that, that doesn't evangelize fossilizes. And it's true. It's true in your own faith. If you are called, you are sent. If you are gathered, you are scattered. The assembled are dispersed because Sunday is always connected to Monday. And you should expect God to be at work in you each and every single day. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it reminds us of our calling, of our purpose, of our identity, indeed even our joy. And it is tangled up with your son and with his kingdom and that mission in which you have sent us to bear witness to Christ and his kingdom. And you're not sending us overseas. But as we go, 
in the rhythms of our lives, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our homes, in our relationships. And we take every opportunity to bear witness in word and deed. Would you help us not to forget that? Would you help us not to drift from that? And would you help those in our congregations that have not really grasped it, to grasp it? Their lives are not their own. And because they're called, they are sent. Would you help our young people to recalibrate their expectations of what it is to follow Jesus, that they might follow him well, and not live well, and speak well, and serve well? And would you help us, those who are older, not to drift from that mission, not to forget it, but rather to be so interwoven into our, our lives, into our souls, that we constantly see opportunities to bless people in word and deed, that the kingdom might be manifest and demonstrated in our own lives because we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's uh, respond to God's word. We're going to uh, do that in song. Uh, Behold the Lamb of God. Expectations of church. Apparently, in Presbyterian churches, kids raise their hands. Mother and musicians do lots of 
flourishing on pianos. I don't know where all this joy comes from, uh, but let's take it to the Lord now in prayer. Let's pray. Now, Father, it is a joy uh, to be loved in your Son, uh, to be set free so that we fear no condemnation. That's a good thing because as we read your word and as we sit under it, we often feel uh, convicted, uh, rebuked and corrected, which is the very point of Scripture. But we're not depressed or discouraged because we know there is grace and forgiveness and there is power and authority in the gospel. And so even though we confess as we gather this morning that we fall so short in our lives, so many opportunities that go begging, uh, so many conversations that are not entered into, so many opportunities of doing good, mercy, showing love, manifesting the kingdom in word and deed, and we often leave them undone. Oh, how we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for grace. And we thank you for your mercy and how we pray that your word would do a work of grace in our lives. So it would change us, would transform us, would reprioritize and redirect our lives and where we've drifted, thinking life is about ourselves or pleasure or enjoyment or achievement. But your gospel might draw us back to our lives are hidden in you and we have to seek first your kingdom because those who are called are always sent. And so, our Heavenly Father, be gracious to us this morning. Forgive us of our sins of omission. And encourage us that the gospel is powerful so that we will not be gripped by fear. Give to us boldness as we speak to family members and friends and workmates and we, we offer them hope, the hope of the gospel the joy of the Christian life that allows us to raise our hands and have musical flourishes and, and for our prayers to be peppered with thanksgiving because you are good and your goodness and your grace and your mercy is lavished upon us in your Son and daily in your grace. And so we thank you for that. We pray something of that joy of your salvation, something of that thankfulness of your provisions will be evident in how we respond. We offer up our worship today and we pray that our thoughts, the loves of our heart, actions in our lives, that all of those things will please you. There will be acts of worship. We offer up our free will offerings that we have given in the weeks past as we've done that physically or electronically. We do this as an act of worship too because we want to further your kingdom and we understand that if we seek first your son, then everything else will be added to us. And we can trust you because you are sufficient for us. Oh, how we pray from the youngest to the oldest that this would be our experience. We want to pray for the city which you have placed us to be witnesses, to proclaim your kingdom. We want to pray for our fellow believers in various congregations throughout Geelong that you would bless them and send them and equip them and encourage them and give them boldness and blessing and much fruit for their labours and answers to their prayers. We're very mindful that Jesus said to his disciples that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I know we're meant to be sent, so often we don't go. We thank you for the grace of the gospel, that we have forgiveness for this, but oh, how we pray that you would rather have obedience to this, because there is joy in giving and sharing and witnessing. And as we do that, our own lives, our own faith is strengthened and enriched so it doesn't become fossilized or petrified. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation, for the leaders of our nation, 
to the leaders of our state that you would give them wisdom to lead and to legislate. And so we pray, surround them with those who can guide and bless and give them wisdom and particularly those who understand the gospel. We particularly want to pray for Christians in all the corridors of power that you would enable them to bear witness as they ought, to be salt and light in those places. For our missionaries overseas, although most of us are sent uh, in proximity to where we live, some are sent further afield. And we thank you for them. And so we pray for them and we support them. And we ask in particular that you would bless uh, the, the work of the gospel in the Middle East and in India and the many whom we support in those nations. Particularly think of Murph and Urfa and their endeavours and how we would pray that you would use that to bring many to yourself. We want to pray for individuals. Pray for Hank at this time. Pray for your healing hand and wisdom uh, for those who are tasked with his care. Pray for Kay, who will continue to uphold and strengthen her and all the family. We pray for those who are discouraged or depressed or going through a difficult season, uh, that you will encourage and strengthen them and they might look to you and not become embittered or uh, easily discouraged or giving up, but rather to find goodness and grace in your promises, uh, to visit you in prayer and to find strength in that too. We pray for those whose lives are going well, uh, where there's much joy and much thanksgiving and there's many blessings at work or at home or your provisions seem so abundant and we rejoice with them and give thanks for those provisions while not becoming over-reliant upon them. And Heavenly Father, Lord, there are many unspoken prayers, difficult things that we can't perhaps even usher, our sins that we feel entrapped by, shame or the heaviness and weight of burdens and responsibilities that, that rob us of joy and yet we find it hard to articulate or put them in words, that you know these things. And so our soul groans, that the Spirit takes our groans and intercedes on our behalf. And may that be our encouragement for each and every one of us this morning. The Lord knows, the Lord cares, and the Lord hears and responds according to his goodwill. Uh, that is our expectation and our confidence. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Well, let's uh, conclude our worship with the singing of our last song. Let's stand and we'll sing together our last song of praise, Cornerstone.
Well, indeed, we stand before the throne with no fault, covered in the righteousness of Christ, and therefore you can be confident that God's blessing is yours in his name. Uh, lift up your hearts and receive that blessing even now. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his counts upon you and grant you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.